this is the introduction to IRAP. Today, you're going to get an awareness of the global road safety context. You're going to get to know who IRAP is and what we do. You'll see a couple of examples about how IRAP is helping to save lives. And as I said earlier, you're going to learn how to use the star rating demonstrator. So to get started, one of the interesting things about road infrastructure safety is that few people are aware of the substantial difference to, in safety that road design makes. In the general community, people are often not aware that um, the way a road is designed has a big impact on how safe it is. And in fact, there's many cases where road engineers themselves are not fully aware of that um, important difference. On the road on the left that you can see, that's a road from Australia, my home country. Uh, and on the right, you can see a road that's in Sweden. To many people, these two roads are quite similar. And in this case, they let's say they have the same speed limit. People travel along the road at the same speed. You could be the same person driving in the same car at the same speed, but just because of the way the road is designed, you face different levels of risk. And in fact, the road on the left has a risk rating or a risk of death and serious injury that's about five times higher than the road on the right. And you can see we would give it a one star on the left and the photo on the right, we would give four stars. So understanding those often subtle differences in the way that roads are designed is pretty much what IRAP does. We provide a tool for measuring those differences and communicating um, what the levels of risk are on different types of roads. The reason that that's important is because road safety is incredibly important. Road crashes are the leading cause of death for young people worldwide. It's a stunning statistic that not many people are aware of. Worldwide, 3,500 people are killed in road crashes. Another 100,000 people daily suffer life-changing injuries. Between now and 2030, millions and millions of people are going to be killed and injured on the world's roads. The sorts of injuries that people suffer are devastating. If you have a chance to talk to a trauma surgeon, uh, particularly in a, on, in a country that's developing, those surgeons will often tell you that the sorts of things that they deal with, the sorts of injuries that they deal with, are not dissimilar to the sorts of injuries that people suffer during wartime. Their amputations, quadriplegia, severe brain damage, burns, degloving, dislocations, fractures. These sorts of crashes leave a huge impact on a community and on families. If any one of you have been unfortunate enough to lose someone in a crash or have a friend or a family member injured in a crash, you know what sort of emotional and social impact that has. But crashes also have an enormous financial impact uh, on the country's economy, but also in the family's uh, daily life. Many countries have a serious problem where if someone is killed in a crash, the family then needs to borrow money to pay for the costs that they've, they've incurred and the lost income that they've incurred. So dealing with road crashes is, to me, the most important reason for getting involved in road engineering. So IRAP was created to help tackle that huge problem. We're a registered charity, we have a simple vision. Our vision is a world free of high risk roads. We do something fairly, fairly simple, we measure. We measure the risk on roads all around the world and come up with suggestions about how you might reduce that risk. We've worked with about 80 countries around the world and assessed more than a million kilometers of roads. Uh, we're quite a small team. There's about 20 people in the entire IRAP team, but we've been able to make a pretty big impact and spread all around the world by partnering with some of the leading organizations in road safety globally. So one of our key program donors is the FIA Foundation. We have a long history of working with the FIA. In fact, IRAP and road assessment programs began with the FIA motoring clubs in a number of countries in, the, in Europe and Australia and the US. It started by the motoring clubs rating roads for safety, giving them a star rating for how risky or how safe they are and communicating that to decision makers and to the community. 
but we quickly developed into a program that works very closely with road agencies, road owners and designers to help improve the safety of road designs. And that's where our connection with the Global Road Safety Facility, which is part of the World Bank, um, became very strongly developed. We also work through the Global Road Safety Facility. We work through, the, through them with Bloomberg Philanthropies and FedEx sponsors our Safe School program. We also have the opportunity to partner with develop, uh, many development partners worldwide, including the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, BHP Billiton and Google. We work with some of the leading research institutes worldwide. So here in this webinar series, we're partnering with ARB. In the UK, we work with TRL. We partnership, have a partnership with SWAV, with Myros, the Institute of Transport in Mexico, the Korea Transport Institute. Each one of these institutes helps to develop and, and feed in research that drives the IRAP models. They're also members of what we call the Global Technical Committee, and that's the committee that oversees and governs the development of the IRAP model. And we have what we call self-governing programs as well. We really encourage countries to take the IRAP program, take the IRAP models and implement them in a way that really suits that local country's context and needs. So we started with EuroRAP, there's OzRAP, USRAP, China RAP. Our most recent edition is Thai RAP. So Chula Longkorn University is at the center of the Thai RAP initiative, which has just begun. So we work at a programmatic level across many regions, but also at a project level across many, many countries. And we're really fortunate now that so many countries and organizations are adopting star rating targets. So in Australia, for example, Queensland, the province of Queensland has said uh, they have a target that 90% of travel will occur on three star or better roads by 2020. In the United Kingdom, they say that 90% of travel will happen on three star or better strategic road networks, uh, part of the strategic road network by 2020. And they're looking for four and five star ratings for uh, motorways. Other countries have adopted similar targets and the Asian Development Bank, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the United Nations have all adopted star rating targets for projects that they work in as well. So if you're involved in road design uh, virtually anywhere in the world, ensuring that your roads are getting up to at least three stars should be a real target that you're aware of and really interested in trying to achieve. At the center of how we think about road safety in IRAP and how the model was developed is what's become known as the SAFE system. Uh, and this is possibly the, I guess, the leading philosophy about how to manage safety worldwide. Uh, it, has a, it has its, I guess, its foundations uh, in similar philosophies like Vision Zero from Sweden or sustainable, trans, uh, sustainable safety from the Netherlands. It really emphasizes the need for safer people, safer vehicles, safer roads, and safer speeds. What it essentially says is you can't achieve a completely safe system without focusing on each of those four elements. We can build roads to be very safe, but we really need people to behave safely. We need them to be traveling in safe vehicles, and we need them to be traveling at safe speeds. So the interplay between those four things is incredibly important. Um, and at the center of it is the understanding that human beings, we have a limitation. And those, that limitation comes through in two ways. One, we make mistakes. And two, we're actually quite fragile. And one of my favorite ways of dealing with this is, or explaining this, is to give a little thought experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'll get you to imagine that, uh, and you might even like to shut your eyes while you do this, and get you to imagine that you're a developer. You're building a fabulous new tall apartment building. And you say to the architect, although I want this to be a fabulous new building, I also want you to try and save some money somehow. I want you to do it a little bit cheaper. So the architect says to you, okay, what we're gonna do is on the balconies, like the one on the screen, we're not gonna build the handrail. We're gonna save money by not building the handrail. Instead, what we're gonna do is put up a sign on each of the balconies. 
And the sign is going to say, when you come out on this balcony, don't run, don't drink alcohol, don't run around, like don't go too fast, don't be distracted by your mobile phone, don't be tired. Because if you do any of those things, you run a risk of falling off the balcony. And actually, to add to that, what we'll do is also draw a white line along the edge of the balcony. Now, I don't need to tell you what happens next, right? Someone at some point is going to fall off one of those balconies. We know that that's going to happen because people make mistakes. We can tell people how to behave. We can put up signs, draw the white line. But at some point, someone is going to make a mistake and fall off the balcony. And because we know that human beings are fragile, their chances of being killed or seriously injured once they fall off is really high. So in building construction, the engineers and architects, they implicitly know the importance of building the infrastructure to help manage risk. But we don't totally get that in road engineering yet. We still are doing the equivalent of building a road without the, the equivalent of a handrail. So thinking about this safe system, Whenever we're designing a road and when we're star rating a road, we're, all, we're always trying to think about what mistake could happen on this road and what would be the consequences of that. So getting into what IRAP does, we have four key protocols. The protocol that's, uh, I guess, best known, well, most well known is the star ratings. So in the top left of the screen, you can see a picture of a road in Beijing some cyclists and that road gets a four star rating um, in the IRAP model. And you can see it's basically essentially because the bicyclists have got their own space. One of the other protocols that we use very commonly is called the Safer Roads Investment Plan. And that's closely linked to the star ratings. In fact, it's the second stage that happens after you do the star ratings. And that's a plan that gives you suggestions about what could be built on a road and what would be its effect in terms of A, lifting the star ratings, and B, how many lives it might save over a period of time. And that plan is based on the financial cost of building the facility and also an estimate of the economic saving of the crash costs avoided. And in this case, this little example you can see in the city of Bogota in Colombia, you can see where there's the blue dots are where bicycle lanes have been suggested in the IRAP assessment. And we're very lucky to, to have seen actual bike lanes uh, implemented and upgraded in Bogota as part of the work there. One of the other protocols that we use is called crash rate risk mapping. And here you can see a map from Slovenia. And this is showing the crash rate, so actual crashes um, along each section of road. The sections that are black colored are the highest risk where most crashes happen given the uh, traffic volumes along the road. And the green sections are the, where the lowest numbers of crashes are happening. And so using this, you can see the actual safety performance based on actual crashes. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see what we call performance tracking. I think the heading is not come up yet. There it is. Uh, and this is basically using the star ratings or the crash rates to track the changes over time. And in this case, you can see one of the locations where a school crossing has been improved in South Africa. Before, the road was rated one star. After the improvements were made, it lifted up to three stars. So it gives an opportunity to really celebrate the successes uh, that we can have with good, safe engineering design. One of the interesting things and the benefits of using the star ratings is that you don't need to wait for crash data to accumulate over a period of time. The moment that the new facility is built, you can star rate it and celebrate the new rating. In this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the star ratings and the investment plans. These are the ones that are used most often around the world. And here on the screen, you can see the process that we use. It begins with a road survey. And very simply, what that is, is taking a video and videoing a road, so seeing what's actually there. One of the interesting things about road safety is that although the roads are built by someone and designed by someone, it's actually very hard without going to look at it to find out what's actually there. So the first step is to go and see what is actually there and collect the videos. Who is the road coding phase? So we take the video 
and we look at the images of the road and record the road attributes. And we do that every single or every 100 metres along the road. So we're going to record things like numbers of lanes, whether there's paved shoulder, whether there's sidewalk, pedestrian crossing, etc. So we do that every 100 metres along the road. Based on that data, which is kind of like a road inventory, we can produce the star ratings. And from that, we get a star rating for vehicle occupants, for motorcyclists, for pedestrians and bicyclists. And that's a really important point, that separation of the star ratings. It's very common to see, for example, a road get a reasonably good star rating for vehicle occupants. Traditionally, roads can be built fairly well for vehicle occupants. But it's very common for the star rating on that same road for motorists, pedestrians and bicyclists to be not as good. Particularly in highway design, pedestrians are the forgotten road user. And so we might see a four or five star rating for cars, but a one or two star rating for pedestrians. The other way that that's important is that different countries have different uh, road use mix, user mixes. So for example, in the US, the vehicle occupant star rating is of most interest because most road users travel around in cars. In Vietnam, the motorcyclist star rating is of most interest. In some of their cities, more than 90% of vehicles are motorcycles. So the motorcycle star rating is incredibly important. From that, we then produce the investment plans that I was speaking about earlier. And so we look at the priority safety countermeasures. So we can say, for example, if you have $1 million and you've looked at a series of roads, how would you spend that $1 million in a way to get the best bang for your buck in terms of saving lives and lifting the star ratings? Or if you have $100 million, what would the plan look like? So the software that we use, Beta, is capable of helping you make some of those plans. After you've made that plan, we hope that you quickly move into designing the roads. So selecting the safety countermeasures that you've, you've produced in the investment plan and turning them into designs. And we can do star ratings of designs as well. So in the same way that we look at the videos of an existing road, we can look at the designs, the cross sections and the plans of a, a road and produce star ratings as well. So at that point, if your uh, government or the development bank has set a target that this road must get to at least three stars, you can test whether your design is getting that far. Then we hope that you move to implementation because after all, you're not gonna save a life by doing an IREP assessment alone. You only start to save lives when something actually gets built. And then once that happens, we can do the process again. So survey the road after it's upgraded. What you hope to see is that the star ratings of a road improve as you move through the design and into the implementation phase. But of course, it's possible that the opposite happens. A road could be upgraded and the star ratings go down. That also is really worthwhile and valuable information because it gives you a guide about what else you might need to do. Uh, there's a little video, like a two minute video that explains a little bit about more about how the star ratings can be used. Here's a typical way that an IRAP star rating assessment can be used. We can start with a network of roads. It doesn't need to include all the roads in your country, province or city but it should include the important ones where most people drive, ride or walk. When the assessment's done, you're gonna have star ratings for the road network. There'll be separate star ratings for vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, pedestrians and bicyclists. Sections rated one or two stars are the highest risk. Sections rated three stars or four or five stars are the lowest risk. You'll also get a safer roads investment plan. That's a plan that lists out safety countermeasures that could be used throughout the network to improve the star ratings and save lives. The size of the plan, the cost of the plan can be adjusted to meet your budget needs. With that information, you're in a position to start setting targets or policies for the network of roads. For example, you might say that by 2025, we will eliminate all one-star roads for all road users. Or by 2030, three quarters of travel by vehicle, motorcyclists, bicyclists, or pedestrians will be on roads rated three stars or better. 
From there, local planners and engineers can focus in on the priority sections of road. They can bring the IRAP data together with, for example, results of a road safety audit. That's where a road safety expert goes out on site and examines the local conditions and local environment in detail. They can bring in crash data so they, they can see what types of crashes are actually happening on that section of road. They can put that together with their local knowledge to develop a safety plan for that section of road that truly reflects the local conditions. Local designers can then take that plan and turn it into detailed instructions about what will be built and how it will be built. It's good practice to perform a design stage road safety audit at this point as well. The designs can also be star rated so that you have a measure of the likely impact on safety that the designs will have. When the designs are built, it's again good practice to perform a road safety audit before the road is formally open to traffic. And IRAP star ratings can be performed at this point as well so that you have an objective measure of the change in risk that the road improvements are likely to have made. Overall, when applied across many local areas and priority sections of road, even small improvements can add up to large life-saving gains right across the network of roads. So, I said earlier that we look at each image every 100 metres along the road, and this gives you this slide here, gives you a bit of a summary about what the attributes are that we measure every 100 metres along the road. So we measure things like the, that can be categorised into the geometry. That's the number of lanes, how wide the lanes are, what the curves are, is there dips or crests, and uh, what, are the, what are the slopes, like the gradient. We look at things like the delineation. So is there edge lines and centre lines? Are there signs in place? We'll look at intersections. Is there an intersection present? If so, is it three leg or four leg? Is it signalised? Does it have protected turn lanes? We look at facilities that influence safety for bicyclists, such as bicycle lanes that can be segregated from the road or integrated into the road, uh, or even if there's wide paved shoulder that gives the bicyclist some space to move along. We look at things like pedestrian crossings. Is there a traditional at grade marked crossing like a zebra crossing? Or is there a raised crossing, a signalised crossing, a overpass like a pedestrian bridge? So in total, we look at about 50 different attributes that we know influence the likelihood of a death or serious injury happening. Now, really importantly, each one of those attributes is backed up by some sort of international evidence uh, in terms of a crash modification factor. So what you can see on the screen here is the risk factors that are used in the IRAP model uh, for the risk of pedestrians, uh, risk of pedestrian death or serious injury while they're crossing a road. So let me explain it a little. Across the bottom, you can see the number of traffic lanes in each direction. So one, two, three, four. Uh, and then these numbers going up the scale are the relative risk of death and serious injury used in the IRAP model. So what this is saying is if you increase a road from one lane in each direction to two lanes in each direction, so double the number of lanes, you don't double the risk of a pedestrian being killed when they're crossing the road. The risk goes up by nearly three times, 2.8 times. So by adding extra lanes in each direction, all other things being equal, the pedestrians are going to be at significantly more risk of being killed and serious inj seriously injured while they cross the road. And that's very interesting because other, all other things being equal, adding an extra lane is generally a good thing for vehicle occupant safety uh, because it gives a chance, particularly on a highway, gives a chance for vehicles to pass one another without going onto the wrong side of the road. So you might widen the road, add extra lanes and improve the star ratings for vehicles. But in doing so, you'll reduce the star ratings, make them worse for pedestrians. So it tells you that you need to do some sort of extra facility for pedestrians. On our website, irap.org, in the resources section, you can find methodology fact sheets that explain every one of the road attributes. And it's going to give you a table that lists all the attributes that we look at and what the relative risk factor is and the research that we use to back that up.
One of the other really important attributes that's used in the model is speed. And we're interested in the speed limit of a road, but we're actually more interested in the operating speed. What is the actual speed that people drive along the road? So we might have a road with 60 kilometer hour speed limit, but if people drive at 80 kilometers an hour, that's what we're interested in. And you may have seen charts like this before. And basically what it says is at low speeds, then the risk of fatality, uh, fatality occurring, so that's on the vertical axis here, is relatively low. But as speeds tend to increase, so let's look at the red line here for pedestrians, as the speed increases, you get to a point, like a tipping point, where the fatality risk accelerates really, really quickly. And here the tipping point is somewhere between 30 and 40 kilometers an hour. So at about 30 kilometers an hour, your risk of being killed if you're struck by a car is relatively low. But by the time you get up to 50 kilometers an hour, your risk is incredibly high, like you're getting up to 80 or 90% chance. So we take that, these curves are basically incorporated into the IRAP model. And we look at the risk for vehicles hitting objects, the side impacts, particularly at intersections and head on risk. So that's an important attribute that's included in the model as well. And you can find out more information about that in those fact sheets that I mentioned earlier. So by applying this model that we've developed for star ratings, some of the things that we've found look like this. Across those hundreds of thousands of kilometers of roads that we've looked at, 81% of roads that have travel speeds of 80 kilometers an hour or more are undivided. And they look like this one in Argentina. So this is a two-way road where vehicles pass each other at high speed. They're only separated by this dashed line. Thinking about the safe system approach that I talked about before, this is basically the equivalent of building a balcony without a handrail. We know that on roads like this, it's not a question of if some horrible head-on crash is gonna happen, it's just a matter of when. We just, if we know how many traffic, uh, vehicles are traveling on that road, it just becomes a matter of probability, how long until two of those vehicles hit each other. Even if I'm driving in one of the safest vehicles in the, in the world today, the safest on the market, if I had a head-on crash at hitting at 80 kilometers an hour, my chances of death and serious injury is incredibly high. There's a very high chance that I'll be killed, even in the safest vehicle today. But we know that there's in, uh, infrastructure solutions that can totally eradicate that sort of death. And a road like this with the median barrier in the center, it's the same as building the balcony with a handrail. It's like a vaccine for head-on crashes. So some of the roads that we look at are built like this to eradicate the head-on crash risk. As another example, more than 80% of the roads that we've looked at where traffic travels at 40 kilometers an hour and they have pedestrians have no formal sidewalk. In fact, many of the roads we look at do have a sidewalk, but it's not accessible because cars park on it, street vendors sell their, their goods on there, or it's taken up with infrastructure like power boxes or power poles. And this is an example not far from where I live here in Manila, and it's very common. Once you have people sharing pavement like this with moving vehicles, especially faster moving vehicles, the risk of death and serious injury is incredibly high. And we know that sidewalks make an incredible impact on risk for pedestrians. Once you have pedestrians able to walk off the pavement, their risk of death and serious injury declines dramatically. One of my favorite case studies that I, I talk about quite often in these presentations is from Mexico. So the Mexican uh, uh, national government did an assessment of 40,000 kilometers of their national highways in 2012. So they star rated 40,000 kilometers of roads. And you can see that in the top map here. You can see lots of sections that are colored one star, which is black, red is two star, orange is three star, and a little bit of yellow here and there. There probably is a patch of five star here and there as well. By 2015 though, the map had changed. So they did the assessment again in 2015 across those same roads. And what they saw was that the percentage of road rated three stars or better had gotten 17% higher. So there'd been an improvement in star ratings. So the other way of saying that is the number of roads or the percentage of roads rated one or two star was 17% lower. And 
that didn't happen by accident. They used the IRAP results to systematically guide their investment in making improvements. And this is one example of one of the highways that they improved between Quetro and Iropuato. This road's about 95 kilometers uh, in length. In 20, 2012, about 10% was rated three stars or better. So I put another way, 90% was one or two star. So by 2015, they'd lifted that to 90% or 89% three stars or better. So you can see some of the things that they did was put in the safety barriers on both sides of the road. But also, if you look closely down here, you can see the uh, edge line, the rumble edge line strips, like the audio tactile line, which really helps to reduce the risk of runoff road crashes. So they lifted the road from 90% one and two stars to 90% three stars or better. And they saw a 52% reduction in fatalities on that road. So really substantial improvement by doing improvements that are not necessarily the most sophisticated and the most difficult, but just using proven, very affordable treatments in a very targeted way. In Australia, for example, on the Bruce Highway in the province or state of Queensland, um, you've also seen this dramatic improvement in crash rates over a period of time, and it correlates very strongly with the infrastructure improvements that have happened. So the Bruce Highway is about 1,600 kilometres long, and the yellow line here you can see is the serious injuries declining rapidly between 2011 and 2017. So those are indicated by the right-hand uh, axis, and on the left-hand axis corresponds with the green line, which is the fatalities, and you've also seen a significant reduction. TMR, the Transport and Main Roads Department, is using the star ratings to help monitor the, the improvements and guide the investments over time. So here's an example of the road in, uh, I want to say, 20, uh, 2007, and here it is again in 2017. And you can see that the, the infrastructure improvements are, again, reasonably subtle. But what they've done is put in a wide centerline treatment, which separates the opposing traffic flows a little, but also put in these rumble edge lines and center lines so that it helps to keep cars into their, in, their, in their lane. So it helps reduce the deviations from, from the lane. There's also speed limit reductions that have happened along the road. That's not all that they've done. They've done other treatments, targeted treatments along, across the network as well. But the star ratings are really helping to guide the investment and track the improvements over time. And one of the reasons that the star ratings have seen a really large uptake is because of this sort of relationship. So what you can see here is uh, black, red, orange, yellow, green, which is one star, two star, three star, four star, five star. And the vertical is the cost um, of deaths and seriously injured per vehicle kilometer traveled um, in US dollars. So it's the cost of the crashes controlling for traffic flows. And what you can see is, generally speaking, the cost of, of the crashes occurring on one stars is about double what it is on two stars. Or put another way, if you can move a one star road to a two star rating, you can expect a, on average a halving of the crash costs. If you move that two star road to three star, you get about a halving again, and so forth all the way through to five stars. That helps to explain why we've said, at least get your roads to three stars, because you can see that dramatic improvement between moving from one and two stars up to three stars. So if you can get your network up to, up to three stars or better, particularly the roads that have got high traffic volumes, you should expect to see a really large reduction in the crash costs that are occurring. So last couple of points is that um, we have lots of learning modules. So you have plenty of chances to learn more about IRAP. Like I said, in the next webinars, we're gonna be talking about survey, coding, and what we call VEDA creator. They're gonna give you the backbone of knowledge about how to do this. Uh, but of course, there's lots more detail that we can go into in each one of those topics. But also, we're going to be developing training on our new Star Rating for Design app. So that question I had about uh, earlier about doing designs when there's no baseline, that, that training course is going to delve into that topic in more detail. Uh, we will also have the Star Rating for Schools um, training course running earlier next year. The other point I just wanted to make too is we do have an accreditation system 
uh, in place. This is particularly for consultants who want to be able to bid for projects. So very often, uh, for example, the World Bank will say, we want someone to help us do a star rating of the road that we're looking at, and we want to take bids from people for the best price for the data collection, the coding, or the star rating analysis. Uh, and they often require that those people have IRAP accreditation. So you can get accredited for survey, coding, analysis, and reporting. Soon we'll have accreditation for star rating designs in schools. Um, and it, we can also talk about accredited systems. So you can use a video system that's accredited by IRAP if you're doing your surveys and coding. Um, so you can find out more about that on our website and in the future webinars. So the last point is there's lots of resources and information available. We have so many websites, so five key websites, and I'm not gonna run through each of them here, uh, but I really encourage you to jump into each of them and have a look. There's lots of materials there. If you don't find what you're looking for, you can always get in touch with us and, and find out more information. But what I wanna do right now is jump into our online software, which is called VEDA. I'm gonna introduce you to the star rating demonstrator. So I'm gonna jump into our software. When you go to vida.irap.org, uh, just vida.irap.org, if you haven't used it before, there's a button on the home screen that says register. Very simple, you enter your details, your email. It's gonna send you an email to say confirmation that you've registered. Once you've done that, you can log into Vida. When you log in, you'll see a dashboard and the dashboard looks exactly like this. It has some buttons that you can play with. Uh, your, actually, your one might be a little different. There might be a couple of buttons missing, but generally it's gonna be the same. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see a news guide. What I want you to focus on really at the moment is what's called the demonstrator. So you can click on that button there. When you click on that, it's going to bring up a screen that looks just like this. So it's called the star rating demonstrator. And you can see the picture has four different road users. So I talked earlier about vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, pedestrians, and bicyclists. For each one of those, you can see stars, and underneath, you can see what we call the star rating score. So the stars are based on a score that's calculated based on those crash modification factors that I talked about earlier. One of the good things to do when you first come in here is click on the question mark. It's gonna give you some information about what the star rating demonstrator is. And really importantly, it's gonna give you a link to what we call the coding manual. So the coding manual is basically where we define what each of the road attributes are and what each of the categories are. So I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment, but definitely worth downloading the coding manual. It's really important. So when you look at the screen, if we scroll down a little, you can see we've got a standard, a series of standard cross sections. And at the moment, we've got the basic urban cross-section highlighted. So you can see that in orange there. I'm just waiting for people's screens to refresh to make sure everyone's keeping up. So I've clicked the basic urban situation. If I scroll back up, you can see for the, this basic urban scenario, it's three stars for vehicle occupants, three stars for motorcyclists, two stars for pedestrians, and three stars for bicyclists. What you can then do is start to tinker, I guess, change some of the road design attributes that we're looking at. So along this menu here, you can see there's a roadside option, mid block option, intersections, flow, vulnerable road users, which is BRU, and speeds. So within each one of those categories, you can see a list of different attributes. And you can see there's different options for, for example, what's on the driver's side of the road, on the edge of the road, on the passenger side. It's asking, are there paved shoulders on each side of the road and shoulder rumble strips? And similarly for mid-block, there's a whole series of, series of attributes that you can, you can change. Now, when you change each one of those, it's gonna have an effect on the star ratings. So let's go to the speeds option. At the moment, the speed is set to a speed limit of 60 kilometers an hour. And the operating speed is set to 65 kilometers an hour. So we can say, okay, what if we put the speed limit up to 70 kilometers an hour? So at the moment you can see it's three stars for all the road users, but two stars for pedestrians. 
If I change that to 70 kilometers an hour, I'll let your screens refresh, it's still within the three star, three star, two star, three star. But you might have noticed that the star rating score changed. So although the star rating itself didn't change, the scores did. And put it simply, a doubling in the score is a doubling of risk of death and serious injury. So what if we made this road 90 kilometers an hour? Okay, you can see that that makes a substantial difference. So we've now got two stars, two stars, one star, two star. So we've got a situation now where we've created a high speed environment through an urban area. And what we could do is start to play with some of these attributes throughout the, the model. So we could start to say, what if we added sidewalks to the roads to offset some of that risk? You can see it's still two star, but the risk score itself has come down significantly. So you can use the star rating demonstrator to experiment with what the star rating might be for a particular section of road. You can take a photo of a road and adjust the attributes in the demonstrator to see what the star ratings might be. After you've done that, you can click on the load save button and you can see over on the right here, you have an option to save that cross section that you've created. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and please do stay in touch.